All right, this chapter has been all about examining impurities in materials, right? We've been talking about them, but how exactly do you go about looking at them and finding them, examining them? We need some tools. So let's talk about microscopy for a minute. There's different types of microscopes out there. There are optical microscopes and there's electron microscopes, right? And even then we break into different categories. So we're just gonna give you some high level uh, overviews of the differences between these, right? First off, why do we need these? Well, if you were to pull out one of your hairs and you can see it, a hair is around 50 microns and that's getting pretty close to the resolution that our eyes can see. So if you wanna see something smaller than a micron, which is honestly most of the interesting stuff in the material science universe, you're gonna to have to not use your actual eyeball, you're gonna to have to use a microscope of some sort, okay? So let's start with optical microscopes. Uh, optical microscopes, uh, like the name sort of suggests, optics, right? You're using lenses, right? And you're using light to look at matter through these lenses, okay? So um, that means if you have an opaque material, like a metal that's gonna reflect light off of it, then you can only look at the surface, right? Because light's gonna come down, it's gonna interact with that matter, going to bounce back up through the lens into your eyeball where you're going to take in information, right? Almost always these are done in reflective mode, but not always, right? Um, what's interesting is that when you do run them in reflective mode, you can get different grains of your material that reflect the light differently. Like, for example, imagine that you've got in this picture here a bunch of crystal and lattices that are oriented like that, but over here in this grain, they're oriented like that, and over here, they're oriented like this. Well, one could imagine that the light's gonna come down, hit those atoms, and then bounce off differently, depending on how those atoms are arranged. Therefore, some of the light might bounce back more fully right back at you, and so that's gonna show up really bright. Some of it's gonna mostly bounce away, and therefore it's gonna look really dark, and some might be in the medium. And you can see this when you look at, say, metals that have been polished nicely. It'll look like a bunch of different colored regions of the metal, and so you're like, oh shoot, maybe I've got different metals there, but it's actually all the same metal, possibly. It's just that you have different grains with different orientations, and so the reflectivity changes, right? Um, oftentimes we want to see these grains because we want to know how big the grains are because that influences things like mechanical and other properties. So something that we'll often do is we will intentionally make it so that these grain boundaries reflect light differently. That's what you see here on the picture on the left, right? Normal light is coming in and doing its thing. But if you've done something to the grain boundary, like etch it so it has this sort of pit, then when light comes in, more, most of the light will get caught in that pit and it won't escape or it'll bounce out but not back to the lens. So these will appear darker. And I'll show you some examples of that. Grain boundaries often have these pits and so they show up darker. You see a big dark spot uh, instead of a grain boundary, which is nice because that's what you want to be able to see is the grain boundaries oftentimes. So how do you make a pit? Well, you, you can etch it chemically. You can put it in acid, for example, a dilute acid for a while that can etch it. Or you can thermally etch it. If you heat it up to a higher temperature, it will form these grooves. And we're not going to talk about the math by why that works, but uh, there's a great paper that I can point you to if you're interested. All right. Um, uh, the smallest resolution that you're going to be able to get to in optical microscopy is, and this is really pushing it, something like 2000x, so that's going to be somewhere around 200 nanometers. And even then, you have to start playing tricks because uh, you have to use shorter and shorter and shorter wavelength light. At some point, your eyeball can't see it anymore, right? We can only see from, what, like 300 to 700 nanometers or so, so you can't go much smaller than that. Um, but you can start changing what's called the numeric aperture. So you, they'll do tricks where they'll mount the sample in oil because then the index of refraction changes. But really, if you're trying to go smaller, like if you're getting into the nanometer regime, optical microscopy is not the tool. Optical microscopy is good for the micron size things, looking at bacteria and things like that. Those are micron size, you can see them really well. Looking at most microstructures, this is a good tool. But when you want to get to the nanostructure or the crystal structure, optical microscopy won't do it for you. You have to do something else. Now, before we move on to what else it can do it, let's talk for a minute about one of the cool things that optical microscopy can do. It's actually sort of a, it's a blessing and a curse. The curse of optical microscopy, maybe you've done this, if you ever tried to look at the surface of something, like if you tried to look at the surface of this foam uh, paintbrush, you'll notice that to get it to focus right on the surface is actually a huge pain. You have to really play with that fine adjustment and get it to focus right at the surface because the the, the depth of field, right, the depth of focus on it is very, very shallow. It has very poor depth of field because its focus region is very shallow. But you can use that to your advantage, especially if you have a semi-transparent. Here's an example of it. It's called confocal microscopy. How it works is you take that focused region, that little height which is in focus, 
and you move that height through your sample. This only works again if your sample is transparent to the light. So take a look here. So here they've got this little piece of pollen grain, right? And they start by focusing down at the very bottom, then they come up a little bit and they focus on that region, they come up a little bit, focus on that. And next thing you know, you have like these tomographic slices all the way through your material that you could then reconstruct these together and create a three-dimensional reconstruction of your image. Very powerful technique, very, very powerful. They use this in medicine and biotechnology and biology all the time, extremely powerful, because then you can start doing other things. You can introduce dyes that interact with light in different ways, so you can see different regions. Here they've got like the orange and the green because they're seeing different regions by the way that light interacts differently with it. Very, very powerful tool. Um, so how <laughs> there's a lot of math behind confocal microscopy. We're skipping it here. We're just giving you a flavor of how it works. But let's leave optical microscopy for a minute and talk about electron microscopes. Electron microscopes are fundamentally going to be able to achieve higher resolution because they can use shorter wavelengths, right? Op like I said, your eyes can see from 300 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So seeing anything below that is going to be a stretch. Um, electrons, though, these can have really short wavelengths. You can accelerate them r with lots of energy so that their wavelength is um, atomic sized, basically, even smaller. Um, so that is really powerful, right? They can get as small as 0 0.003 nanometers if you accelerate enough. And this leads to really high magnification and resolution. Another benefit here is that you've got this beam of electrons bombarding your sample. So you're producing electrons up here. These are just spraying everywhere. So to prevent them from spraying everywhere, we have to collimate them. So we form a column. So it would look like this. Here's your electrons going all over the place. So you can do lots of things to sort of focus them. You can have an aperture where there's only a little hole here. So only some of your electrons can go through the ones that are going basically straight. But there's other things you can do. Because electrons are charged particles moving, we can apply magnetic fields, right? We can apply, apply a magnetic field to this in different directions, right? In and out, left and right. And so we can use that field to squeeze the electron beam down till it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So now we're able to look at a tiny spot with really high resolution and you can generate just incredibly high magnification images, right? Um, so the first type of electron microscope we'll talk about is the transmission electron microscope. How it works is, again, you've got this beam of electrons and you've collimated it and squeezed it and shrunk it down with apertures until you've got this beam of electrons coming down, okay? That beam of electrons is going to hit your sample and it's going to pass right through it, right? So your sample can't be too thick. If your sample is too thick, then the electrons won't pass through it and you get visualization on the bottom, right? Your, your eyeball, if you will, for these things uh, that detects the electrons is on the underside of it, okay? Right? So they have to pass through, right? Um, What's great about this is because it passes through it, you do get information not just from the surface, but all the way through your sample. You can see sort of through the sample, like x-ray vision, right? Um, you get contrast because the materials will diffract differently. So as they pass through, you've got this regular arrangement of atoms in your samples. That's going to cause diffraction to occur, so you actually get diffraction happening. And they're going to diffract differently with different phrases, so you're going to get uh, contrast there. Um, you can get lots of information. You can get crystallographic orientation. You generate these patterns that will tell you exactly what the structure is in terms of the the the, the atomic locations and all that. Um, and essentially, you can achieve up to one million x magnification. So, with tools like this, you can see this. You can see what we're looking at here. This is graphite, right? You can see each one of these is a carbon atom, right? We know that they have like these alternating double bonds all the way through here, and we can actually see that happening here. Uh, you can see the arrangement of carbon in this graphite structure, which is really phenomenal. So if you want to be looking at atoms, this is the tool that you're going to be using is a transmission electron microscope. And again, within the world of TEMs, transmission electron microscopes, there's like 10 gazillion different variations, and there's whole courses on it in our, in our university that you can take. But this is just a primer, so that's TEMs. The other type of electron microscope, which is cheaper, um, but can't go to quite as high resolution, but is really a, a workhorse for material scientists, is the scanning electron microscope. So it is a surface technique. You're mostly looking at the surface. Um, technically, the beam will interact with your surface, right? So if this is the surface. You've got your beam of electrons coming down. They will penetrate the surface a little bit, and then they generate, um, within some volume, they're going to generate what are called secondary electrons, right? So we talked about this before. You've got your atom, with, which has its clouds, right? And if you knock out this electron, it goes flying out. Those are the electrons that come flying out, these secondary electrons, right? And then you've got a detector over here that basically catches those things. 
So how do you create images with this process? Well, you move the beam, right? You're able to raster it. You're able to scan it, right? Using that electric and magnetic field, you're able to move this thing and, and raster it. So you can move your beam over to here, move it to there. You can move it in two dimensions, and you can create a, a really great image, right? Um, other, but you can do other really cool things with it. Instead of just collecting the secondary electrons, the ones that come out of your sample, right? You can look at how many come in and then bounce right back off. We appropriately call those backscattered electrons. Those are the ones that hit nuclei, right? And so they bounce right back up. And so you have a sensor essentially right above your material so you can see how many bounce back. This is great because materials that have a high atomic number are going to bounce back more often, right? They're going to get more contrast than those that have low atomic number. So it's a tool that allows you to look at, you know, aluminum and steel might look really similar to our eyes because we just see the light reflecting off of it. But if you had backscattered detectors in your eye, right, then you'd see that, oh, iron is much more higher atomic number than aluminum, and so it's going to bounce back, and so it's going to appear brighter, right? Totally cool ability that augments how we can analyze material analysis. Um, we already talked about EDS, right, energy dispersive spectroscopy earlier, uh, but that's a really cool thing for figuring out exactly what elements are present and mapping them. We'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, something that happens, though, is because you're bombarding these with electrons, if your sample does not conduct electricity, what's going to happen? Well, pretty quickly, it's going to build up static charge, right? So if your sample is down here and it's building up lots of negative charge, and then you've got a beam of electrons flying down at it, soon they're going to start to get deflected, right? So that's not good. That's going to mess up your imaging capability. So what they do is they coat these materials with a very thin coating of something conductive. A little bit of gold or carbon are very common to do, uh, and it's very thin, so you're not spending a lot of money to do this. Um, okay, it needs to be conducting. Um, the typical magnification that you can achieve with a scanning electron microscope, because it doesn't accelerate the electrons quite as fast to crash them all the way through your sample, you don't get quite the same resolution. Um, in fact, you're typically anywhere between 10x and 50,000x. So you can see um, into the nano regime, but not as far as the TEMs can go. One of the most amazing things about uh, scanning electron microscopes is that they have a huge depth of field, right? Meaning that you can see both the really deep samples and the really high up samples in focus at the same time. So this is some pictures I took, gosh, 25 years ago or something when I was an undergrad, 20 years ago, um, where I took a, a fly and some spiders and stuff and I put them in the SEM. And even though those are like big three-dimensional structures, you can see all of them in focus at the same time uh, because... This, the way that these machines are put together, they have a really high depth of field. And that has to do with uh, basically the aperture distance from the sample and how fast you... It, some optics that we won't get into in this class. Okay? So you can do some really cool things. Lately, they uh, nowadays, you can put different stages inside of your uh, microscopes. You can put heating and cooling stages so you can actually see things like crystallization or melting and watch it in real time. You can create movies of how these things change. You can load um, mechanical testing devices inside and you can break itty bitty tiny things. You can cycle them electrostat uh, galvanically like you can basically like a tiny little battery and you can look at what its microstructure does when you charge and discharge the battery. And you think of it, you dream it up, and basically somebody is doing it right now in terms of in situ experimentation or in operando experimentation. Okay, really cool stuff. Um, and then we've already talked about EDS that you can look at different elements where they are. For example, here we see the green in this frame looks like it belongs to sulfur, and then the yellow looks like it belongs to iron. And then you've got magnesium as this one right over here. So you can see really clearly that this compound here, the 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 inclusion is sulfur and iron, right? Again, look at the regular SEM image right up here. It's hard to kind of tell what's going on. You see something there, but you don't have as much information. But as soon as you turn on backscatter imaging, now it's very clear that there's a secondary phase there, and you know that it must contain high atomic number elements relative to the other things. And then you do EDS mapping, and it just brings all this additional, additional information into it until you can figure out, oh, this is such and such a phase, and if that's not desirable, then you could try and figure out how that ended up in your plant, uh, in your device, right? And then, so we've talked about electron and light and optical microscopy. One slight add-on to this is scanning probe microscopy. This one's different in that it doesn't use like light or electrons to hit your sample and bounce off and you detect them. It literally takes a little tiny stylus and it taps the surface of your sample, right? So you've got this little tiny stylus with a very sharp tip and you've got some sort of sample like the bug's eye or a molecule and it it taps it 
and it taps it and it taps it and it measures the profile as it taps along this thing. Um, the fact that we can actually do this is amazing, right? It's absolutely amazing. You can create these three-dimensional topographical maps with atomic scale resolution. Here they're looking at a molecule. That's what the molecule ought to be and you can see that that's what it looks like when they tap along with it. So anyways, that is some examples of the different microscopy techniques um, which I think are your you're going to use them at some point in your career, these different sort of microscopes to analyze defects in materials, and these are the sort of tools that you might end up using.